So good morning, everybody, and welcome to our combined assurance and the role of risk management in combined assurance this morning. Thank you for the uh, availability of your time. Of course, um, it is so important that we consider combined assurance. And I'm going to introduce the topic for you in a little bit um, later, just wanting to go through a couple of administrative details. So firstly, welcome. We have this morning 216 participants to the webinar, of which 159 of you are from the public sector. So welcome, Limpopa. I hope my, my friends from the road agency um, are here this morning and that they're here in their full force. And then, of course, we have 56 um, participants from the private sector. And you're most welcome to everybody this morning. And not just national. We have some international uh, people attending this morning as well, people from Namibia um, and the like. So thank you. Thank you for availing your time. This is such an important topic. And of course, like I said, I'm going to introduce the topic a little bit later, but let me just deal with some administrative issues. So please use the chat box, chat box on your right hand side of your screen. You see some people in the room and you want to just touch um, up with them and, you know, link up with them and have some conversations. Use your chat box, say hi to everybody, and you could use the chat box for Q&A as well. However, there is a very specific function for Q&A, and it works so nicely. So if you have questions, please post them uh, on the Q&A part, but you are welcome to use the chat box as well. And then we also have our social media platform. Please use hashtag live with IRMSA, one word. Hashtag live with IRMSA, one word. That is our social media platform. You can chat, you can take photographs, and please post it on our social media platform right there. So those are just the, the little bit of administrative issues. Then I've got some highlights for you. It'll be amiss of me if I do not highlight, you know, some of the upcoming events and some of the important lessons and notices that you have to take away from this morning. The first that I would like to talk to you about, and I'm gonna to touch on that when we speak about combined assurance, and more specifically, when we talk about the role of risk management in combined assurance, and that is our professionalization. Our exams are coming up, and for those that have not realized it yet, there is an exemption that you can apply for, so get going look at the requirements, look at your qualifying criteria. And if you are one of those that are lucky enough to apply for exemption to write CRM prac, so get going, you know. Um, so the two exams that are coming up are in October and November, CRM prac and CRM prof. There are closing deadlines, by the way, for these two exams. So for the prof exam that's written in October, please, the 2nd of July, is the cutoff date for registration. And then of course, for the PRAC exam, it's the 9th of July. So be aware of this, do not hold back, get in there 
and register for um, the exams coming up this year. And then of course, training. Now with the lockdown, we deliver training um, and the training can be delivered on site. And that is the important, the in-company training, if you like. And so this training is really cool. And if you want to speak about those sorts of things that we deliver, touch base with the road agency people in Limpopo. We've done that with them quite successfully over a two, three day period. So please be aware of that and contact us if you have specific requirements for an in-house sort of training. It's very personal, it's, it's tailor-made for yourselves and it's really very, very worthwhile um, just to follow up with us should you have a requirement for that. And then of course, we have our first stream uh, our live stream training, which is happening on the 8th of July. And guess the topic? Yes, of course, risk appetite and risk tolerance. One of the most difficult things to get right in risk management. So be on the lookout for this 8th of July. It is going to be a live streamed uh, training session that, that you can uh, attend. And then do not forget about our e-learning platform. It is so flexible. You can govern your own time, your own pace around this. And I think it's important because you have the freedom uh, to fill in your own schedule and to also understand what training I want to do when you can choose the sequence of your training. And I think that's very powerful, especially because everybody's needs are different and you may need something else within your specific environment to happen first. And of course, then you can do that because you have control over that schedule. Lastly, before I get to the meat of this morning's webinar, let me just talk about our upcoming events. So because of COVID, all our events will be digital until further notice. So we have a very special event. I'm not sure that all of you are aware. Papaya uh, comes into, um, into act, into compliance mode, if you like. Um, and we have a Papaya webinar scheduled for the 8th of June. And that will be critical for you to get an onboarding there to understand the impact on your business and also to be able to know what the compliance requirements are in that space. And of course, being risk professionals, once you understand that, you have the context, you understand the stakeholders, and you'll be able to update your risk register, your risk profile, your risk report um, in that fashion. Then, of course, the CRO forum. Guess the topic of the CRO forum, we're talking about risk appetite. Risk appetite has come to the fore. Boards are now pushing specifically on the back of having missed the COVID um, as a risk and asking the question whether it was a black swan or was it a white elephant, doesn't really matter. They are now realizing that not having a risk appetite is what allows misses and mistakes. And for that reason, uh, we have a CRO roundtable coming up on the 30th of June, focusing on the discussions at a board level, not how to set up risk appetite and the like, but the discussions, how to have these discussions, how to report on risk appetite at a board level. And then of course, do not forget that our UMSA conference is coming up the first two days, the 29th and the 30th of September, and then the masterclass. Um, I hope to see you all in the masterclass on the 1st of October. Okay, and then please, we've opened our call for proposals for our conference. If you have an interesting topic, you have an interesting experience, and you would like to come and share that with us, our call for proposals for the conference are open, and please submit your proposals as soon as you can. Okay, so without further ado, and if you have any questions, by the way, you are more than welcome to post them in the chat box. We've got a whole team from UMSA just ready to answer your questions around any of these topics that I've just highlighted with you, whether that be the board exams, whether that be our events or our training, let RIP put it in the chat box and we'll have a conversation with you. Right, so I want to welcome you all again and I want to welcome this morning Boitemelo Mabocha. You may not know, but she is the chairperson of the regional UMSA Limpopo Committee. And for that, um, I will introduce and hand over to you a little bit later. But let me first just say thank you, um, Boitemelo, for your time. Thank you for, for taking the lead on this. Thank you to the Limpopo um, uh, Committee, subcommittee of UMSA that's, that's recognized the importance of 
combined assurance. And why are we saying it is so important? Well, you know, the benefits of combined assurance sits around making sure that we don't have assurance fatigue, making sure that we don't as a first, second and third line or however many lines of defense you have in your organization, that we are getting in there on a repetitive basis and not adding enough value. So that's one of the big uh, uh, upsides of having combined assurance. But the bigger one for me sits in, if we get it right, we can actually identify gaps in our assurance, in the coverage of our strategic risks, in the coverage of our significant risks. I don't like the, 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 the topic or the, or the title, top 10 risks or the top 20 risks, but be that as it may, that is where the rubber meets the road for having an effective combined assurance framework in place, is we can assess the gaps. And then the most important contribution from combined assurance is that we working closer with the internal audit profession, let's call it the assurance profession. And why is that important? Why is this morning so important? It is because as you know, we may change a risk through only changing its causes. We cannot change that in, a, in any other way. And so for that reason, we have to have the right controls associated with really well-defined causes. And if we then apply to that performance management, we change the risk profile of our organizations. And for that reason, working closer with all the assurance providers is critical uh, so that we make combined assurance address all these elements that I've highlighted, but also contribute to more effective risk management. And having um, said that, I'm gonna leave you um, in the ca mo most capable hands of Boitumelo Mabocha. Boitumelo, good morning, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Over good to morning, you. everyone. Thank you so much, Chris, um, for such a warm welcome. And I'd like to welcome everyone to our Limpopo first webinar. Um, the last webinar, the last um, actually breakfast that we had, the physical one was when um, EMSA launched the risk report last year in March before um, the pandemic. But anyway, we just have to get used to the um, new normal. Um, we welcome you, everyone. We welcome you to Limpopo, the heart of Africa. And my name is Widumelo Mabuja, as, been, as it has been indicated. Um, we're discussing a very important um, topic today, ladies and gentlemen, the role of ERM um, in the combined assurance model. And um, with this said, um, I just want to say that we just have to take note of the most important key role players, um, of which it's you, definitely the risk practitioners, and um, governance, the, those charged with governance are board members, are audit committee members, executive management, assurance providers. You know, if we all can just um, get rid of the working in silos mentality and just collaborate, because that's what combined assurance is all about. It's all about collaboration, collaboration. So um, as an Impopo regional committee, I'd like to thank um, them for putting together um, this um, wonderful webinar for selecting this um, topic um, that is um, combined assurance and the role that ERM plays. Um, my team um, in the background, we have worked um, so hard of, on putting this together. We have brainstormed on the topic and we actually um, you know, decided that this is a topic to then um, take on. And um, we thank you, Emsa, for also giving us this platform because um, now at least we get to share, you know, our knowledge with um, the whole country. And in, instead of, you know, usually when we had those physical interactions, it was only when um, only few would come maybe from other provinces. But now we like, we are so happy and delighted to host actually the country. And with the said, I'd like to then say we have stepped up as a committee. That's the CS themes of EMSA that we have to step up. Step up, um, risk practitioner, step up you, executive manager, wherever you are, and actually play your role in us um, providing um, combined assurance. And now I'm going to then hand over to Maria Makongela. Um, Maria Makongela is a qualified and experienced internal auditor and external quality reviewer who is passionate about internal auditing. 
She's also a certified ethics officer through the Ethics Institute. And um, in partnership with the University of Stellenbosch, she is also um, the Chief Audit Executive of Bapalabora Municipality. Um, for the past 12 years to date, in the year 2008, she established the Internal Audit Unit of Marule and local municipalities. Um, um, Ms. Maria has played a very important role in our local government. And with this said, I'd like to then hand over to Ms. Maria to then, um, you know, um, indicate what what are the issues, how are they actually um, practicing combined assurance in the local government. So, um, Maria, over to you. Good morning, uh, Buitu Melo. Thank you so, so much uh, to the rest of the executive committee. Uh, of IMSA in Limpopo, it's a, a wonderful pleasure for me, a pleasure for me to uh, be joining uh, this uh, session this morning and uh, uh, to be sharing uh, the, our experiences uh, in terms of uh, combined assurance. I think um, let me just uh, appreciate the opportunity given and also um, appreciate uh, also the topic, I think, your, your theme for this year is, uh, is just to the point. Um, and I think it, it is relevant in terms of uh, the, the state, the environment that we are in uh, as a country uh, that uh, indeed we need to step up. I think uh, gone are those days where we could just uh, remain at, a, at an uh, ordinary level. One needs to step up uh, uh, in, every area, every discipline where they are, whether it's audit, whether it's risk management, whether it's governance, I, I believe that uh, I think your, your topic or your theme for the year is just uh, to the point. Uh, uh, this morning, I'm, sh I'm, I'm going to make a presentation on implementation of combined assurance. And uh, I will be covering uh, the following uh, 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 topics uh, under the table of contents. Uh, introduction, assurance providers and level of defense, uh, credibility of assurance providers, uh, implementation, benefits, and then I will conclude. Uh, in terms of the uh, introduction, combined assurance is a process of effective coordination and collaboration between management and, uh, and internal as well as external assurance providers with the objective of ensuring that risks are well managed so that institution can achieve their strategic goals and objectives resulting in good performance. I think critical here is that uh, at the center of uh, combined assurance uh, really is risk management because um, we audit because of risk basically. If there was no risk management, I don't think there would necessarily be uh, a lot of work for 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 auditors, and uh, obviously when one is running a business, uh, critical uh, to the success of uh, any business is the management of object uh, uh, risks that are directly uh, impacting on the objective of that particular institution, and therefore in in terms of your combined assurance, really risk management plays a very critical role and risk management is at the center of combined assurance. In terms of King uh, 3, uh, the King 3 introduces combined assurance as recommended a governance practice in terms of the following paragraphs. Paragraph 3.5, which states that the audit committee should ensure that combined assurance model is applied to provide a coordinated approach to all assurance activities. So in terms of this uh, 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 guidance uh, from the King 3, you then see that it is the responsibility of the, uh, the audit committee to ensure that there is a, a combined assurance or there is combined efforts in terms of assurance, different assurance uh, providers within an institution. And I believe that Ms. Angoveni will talk more uh, in terms of that, uh, the, 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 those issues in terms of your audit and your, your risk committee's uh, uh, relation in terms of combined assurance. Uh, in terms of seven, uh, Maria, sorry. I'm so sorry, can you please put your presentation on uh, presentation mode? Oh, it's not showing. 
Okay. My apologies. Is this fine? Okay. Is it fine now? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. My apologies uh, with that. Yeah, I was on on bullet point number four, as a paragraph seven point three point one, where in terms of King three, the internal audit unit should form an integral part of the combined assurance model as internal assurance provider, integrating and aligning assurance processes in an organization to maximize risk uh, and, and governance oversight and control efficiencies and optimize overall assurance to the audit and risk uh, committee considering the organization's risk appetite. I think in terms of uh, uh, King 3, uh, obviously internal audit is the first internal uh, 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 pro assurance provider within an organization. And I think the advice or the guidance there was that the internal audit unit should actually take a lead in terms of uh, implementation of combined assurance within an organization. And I think uh, uh, as much as uh, there is this guidance to say internal audit should take a lead, yes, indeed, internal auditors should take a lead. But at some point where there is maturity, then internal audit would have to, to hand over. And I think I will elaborate that further as we continue with the presentation. In terms of paragraph 15 of the King 3, uh, King 4, a combined assurance mod model which incorporates and optimizes all assurance services and functions so that taken as a whole, this should enable an effective control environment support the integrity of information used for internal decision-making man uh, management, the governing body and its committees, and support the integrity of the organization external reports. I think what I'm actually trying to in indicate here in terms of the introduction is that uh, both the King 3 and also the King 4 report uh, 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 put forward uh, the combined assurance uh, as critical and therefore uh, like uh, the 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 the, uh, 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 the previous speaker has said I, I think it's very critical that there be a uh, combined efforts in terms of putting together all assurance providers within the institution so that we can reduce uh, uh, assurance uh, fatigue then there are different levels of defense i know in terms of this and the levels of defense, some will say there are three levels of defense, some will say there are five levels of defense, but I, I, I believe in the four levels of defense. And I understand that different uh, people or different organization will have their different views in terms of uh, the levels of defense. And uh, I'm, I'm presenting from the level of uh, a, mun a municipality, uh, and then obviously some of the things that I will be indicating here they will be more relevant uh, to, to a local government uh, or municipality. In terms of level one, uh, in terms of the model that I'm presenting is that uh, that will be your management uh, where there, is, there should be management supervision. And when you zoom down into local government, most of the time you will have individuals coming from the uh, provincial treasuries, coming from Coxta, uh, 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 which is the, your, your, your local government department uh, at a provincial level, uh, who are constantly assisting different management. For example, you'll have a person working hand in hand with the CFO, assisting the CFO, or maybe working uh, hand in hand with the supply chain manager, uh, assisting them in terms of uh, putting together their, their processes and also advising them. And I said, uh, from that level, uh, 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 and this I know, uh, uh, we've got, there are people who've got different views in terms of the, the treasuries. But I say, these uh, guys, for me, they are, they are at that level because they are assisting, they are working together with management in terms of uh, 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 doing the responsibility we, responsibilities which management uh, has. Uh, in terms of overseeing different processes at the level of management. And I, I put them there uh, uh, on, on, on level one. 
In terms of level two, the, I think this one is straightforward. You will find here your, your uh, performance management uh, guys. You will find there your legal services, uh, risk management, uh, internal control units uh, uh, at that level. And, and, and this level really is, is level two simply because the rest of these guys are reporting to the accounting officer, uh, not to any uh, 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 external person uh, outside uh, uh, the, the institution. Even if you have your risk management committee, you will realize that your risk management committee chairperson reports to the accounting officer still. And therefore, even though uh, in other institution, you will find that the risk uh, chairperson of risk committee will also present a report to the audit community, but their major role uh, is uh, and their responsibility, their accountability is with the accounting officer. And therefore, also in this uh, level on level two, there are uh, 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 in, uh, people uh, from your national treasury, provincial treasuries, and also uh, COGSTA, who are assisting your PMS unit at the level of PMS, who are assisting your risk management unit at the level of risk management. And that is where I say these very individuals, uh, for me, I will still also put some of them, those that are responsible for this unit, I will then put them under uh, level two of the uh, assurance uh, provider, simply because of the role that they are playing. And of course, this one is, is I think it's a it's a question or it's something for 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 more uh, discussion uh, uh, if you look into the how the, the support uh, because I think uh, from Treasury and Cox, Coxa they will say they are providing support into the municipality how they are providing the support and of course it's not even the same people uh, coming um, um, uh, doing assisting your CFO you'll find that it's not the same people that are actually assisting your risk, uh, your internal control, or even your PMS uh, level. And then in terms of level, level three, that is uh, uh, the internal audit, where the internal audit uh, unit uh, sits. And I say, uh, the, here, the, the, the internal audit reports uh, uh, administratively to the audit committee, which is not part uh, of the day-to-day um, uh, -day running of the municipality or of a, a department. And I also say, in terms of South Africa, you then have uh, your treasury and, and the national treasury who are assisting internal audit. There were instances, if maybe I could give example, where a treasury will come and do an audit and assisted us at some point, do an audit of supply chain, for example. And you can see that you can't say that person is, is seated uh, anywhere else because they are, really independent. But if you get a person that was assisting supply chain manager to put on processes uh, in supply chain manager, and then that, that person comes back and want to, to review the process, then you will see that there will be issues of uh, a, a, a conflict at that level. And I think this is something, uh, the, the, the support provided by these uh, stakeholders, uh, Treasury, your COXA to a local municipality or to any municipality, you'll see that this is something unique for South Africa, which obviously one way or the other, I think more, uh, more uh, studies, more articles might be needed to, re to be written in terms of just really looking into, into that and uh, analyzing the responsibilities that they're providing at this level. And uh, lastly, at level four, I then say uh, you have the Auditor General. Um, Going forward, I think what is very, very critical uh, in terms of the assurance providers is the credibility of assurance providers, the credibility. It is very important to assess the credibility uh, of the assurance providers, and that's what will make uh, your combined assurance to be, to be uh, uh, strong. The assurance provi provided must be credible. This is achieved by ensuring that the skill and experience levels of assurance providers are appropriate for the work to be performed and that the, the extent of work performed will address potential and actual exposure. This is very critical. That is, I, that is why I have highlighted it. Management and audit committee will need to ensure that assurance providers, both external and internal, have the appropriate experience and skills and follow an acceptable 
approach or methodology. I've, I've indicated management and audit committee. Why? Audit committee will, will be in the right position to say, are uh, our assurance providers really uh, qualified? Do they have the right skills? Do they have the right experiences? And management will have to ensure, because these are the employees of management or an institution, then management will have to implement from uh, the recommendations by the audit committee. And I, uh, I've quoted in terms of the international standards on auditing, uh, 620, which is the using uh, the work of an auditor's expert should be read also in conjunction with ISA 200, which is overall objective of the independent auditor and, con uh, and, and the, con the conduct of an, an audit in accordance with international standards on auditing. This standard will give us guidance in terms of how do you get your assurance providers uh, to be credible, will give us a guidance in terms of that. And these are the, the requirements in when you look into these two standards. The, the first one, uh, the standard will outline that uh, the independence or the objectivity, independent reporting lines and uh, no, no recent direct involvement or work done in the areas or, or aspects to be audited. I think this I'm borrowing from the that standard, uh, the auditing standard to say it is important to uh, analyze the independence or uh, the reporting lines of each, each assurance provider. And of course, you will you will see that is why you obviously this will guide you where each assurance provi assurance provider will sit where they are reporting will sh show you whether they should be on three or four uh, or on one or two but at the end of the day uh, you need to look into the independence you must be able to clearly identify uh, or uh, confirm the independence at what level at what specific level are these uh, 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 assurance providers uh, independent. And obviously you'll see from level one, it will be weaker going up to four, it gets stronger and, and stronger. Then the second thing is the conflict of interest. Uh, you need to be uh, able to assess that to say, is this uh, assurance provider conflicted or not? You should be able to look out uh, 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 for any um, areas where there might be a conflict of interest and continuously uh, ensure that your assurance providers do declare uh, the, 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 their interest uh, as you continuously uh, what implement your assurance, uh, your combined assurance in your institution. And then critical, then you also look into the skills and the experience. Why would you want to look into the skills and experience? You, you'd want to look into that because before anyone can rely on the work of another assurance provider, uh, you need to be sure that this person uh, is qualified and is experienced and you can actually rely on their report. Uh, and, and that is why uh, the previous speaker said, we, the major thing is for us to ensure that there is no uh, uh, assurance fatigue. And if you want to reduce assurance fatigue, it means the other assurance providers, if this other one has done this work uh, and they're qualified, then I don't have to go and redo the, uh, the, the assessment again. I can simply looking into their qualifications and all that, I can be able to say, no, I can rely on this report and take it as a, 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 a final or opinion uh, because it's coming from an expert. And then qualifications, uh, the assurance provider should hold appropriate qualifications. And I think here I just indicated that certification will serve as an advantage. Yeah, you imagine in an institution where you, you the institution is older, uh, older I mean in terms of years, and you've got people that have been on different positions, you you you'd, you'd want to, to see a growth in terms of their qualifications. And I think when people are, are certified, uh, that also says a lot in terms of your, 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 the, the experience that they have, the expertise that they actually have. And then assurance methodology. This one uh, is also very critical. A sound audit or review methodology should be adopted 
by the assurance provider, ideally, a risk-based approach should be followed. As I think here is that each and every assurance provider, obviously, they've got some sort of a methodology that they are utilizing. I think it is important uh, for them to have it uh, formally so that one can be, when you assess whether you can rely on, on, on their work, then you are able to also assess their methodology. And in terms of this standard, uh, accreditation body or uh, uh, your professional body, they say it's a non-core aspect. And I've indicated there and B, considering South Africa's ethical environment and the risk attached uh, to, uh, to, to uh, uh, related to ethics, you, you might not want as an institution to say, a registration uh, or registra registration with professional body is a non-core because you don't want to have assurance providers that cannot be held accountable. I think it is very critical to have assurance providers that are belonging to an institute uh, with uh, ethical uh, standards uh, because uh, you then at least you you know for sure that these people can actually be held accountable. And I think my advice is that I would simply take that uh, accreditation or a, pro, a professional membership with a professional a body. I'll actually put it on top as the first of the list, uh, looking into uh, uh, the, the the climax of 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 the environment in South Africa. And you will see that uh, people will say, um, uh, who is this assurance provider? Where are they coming from? And if you say, I am from the, the what, what Institute, people will actually uh, you know, re start relying on you on the basis of your, 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 your membership or your, your registration, because then they know that you are held accountable. And if you are, you are certified, also it means it continuously you are, uh, developing yourself uh, continuously, you are submitting something to account. And if they are not satisfied with your work, they can actually uh, engage your institute and then you can be uh, 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 held accountable. And I think that becomes very critical. In terms of implementation, uh, I have already said the, at the center of combined assurance, the quality of risk management information is very important. It's very, very important. Uh, what is on your risk register? Because you will see that when you start to implement your combined assurance, really, you're going to have to start from your risk register, uh, strategic operational risk registers. You will definitely have to start from the end. What is con contained in your risk register is very critical. It's uh, very important that it be uh, of quality. The foundation for uh, combined assurance and the successful implementation of combined assurance model rests on the quality of the risk management information, poor risk definition, missing critical risk information, and poor control mitigation information will negatively affect the implementation of combined assurance. The first step in the process is completing the assurance map by indicating who assures what risk and to where this assurance is reported. I think what, one of the uh, advice I can give is that the, your internal audit unit should be before they can develop an annual plan, should be able to assess the process of identifying your, risk, uh, uh, your risks and also putting together your risk uh, registers and also test certain things uh, in terms of your, your risk register before they can even uh, utilize uh, the risk register. Uh, to to uh, to put together your audit plan, and that process should assist uh, in, in uh, improving the quality of your risk register. And then this is I've just indicated here what an assurance map will look like. If you look into this one, this table, what I'm indicating there is that your first column it will be your risk number or your risk description, whatever. Sorry, Maria. You say this is the risk. Sorry. Sorry, Maria. Just four more minutes until the end of your presentation. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, should I wait? Oh, I'm, re I'm remaining with four minutes. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Thanks. okay. Thank you so much, my, my apology. I think I'm taking long. Okay, fine. I think from this one, the assurance map, I'm just gonna pass. Uh, you would see that the, the first column, it will be a risk number. The second column, it will, you will indicate who is currently giving assurance. If there is no one, 
Then the second column, which is the proposed, then you'll be able to say, we propose that this one will be giving assurance uh, on this particular risk. Then you are able to see how your risk uh, assurance is going to be. And then in terms of uh, the risk, uh, the combined assurance committee, I would advise that you develop, you establish an assurance, uh, a combined assurance committee where you would have your risk, uh, uh, all the assurance providers uh, from your, your, your level, uh, level two and also going up, up, up to the auditor general. And I think in government, most of the time, the challenges will be to uh, actually get your auditor general to serve into your, uh, your combined assurance committee. So I think it's very critical that you establish that uh, risk committee, uh, 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 combined assurance uh, committee. And from there, after you have uh, put together your combined assurance uh, committee, then it will be important for you to develop a combined assurance uh, framework. I'm not going to speak much because of, of time, but there the, the are the information what needs to go into your uh, combined assurance uh, framework. What is critical is that this framework needs to be approved by either your board if you are in under your, your company's act uh, 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 or, or uh, your, your council, if you are maybe a municipality or so. I think critical there is the approval of the combined assurance. And then also very, very critical, it will be your terms of reference and also your combined assurance plan and also your strategy. The terms of reference, it will assist you in terms of also securing all your assurance provider, especially your auditor general, because they are not within the, your municipality or within your institution. If you can have a terms of reference where they buy into that, then you agree, you put together uh, the dates that are aligned with your institutions, with all the institutions, so that you are actually able to sit and be uh, able to uh, deal with all uh, issues relevant for your institution. And then from there, uh, I've already indicated that the, 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 last, the, the other step, it will be to deal, to now look into your current risk register and also uh, indicate who is uh, 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 giving assurance where, and then whether there is too much assurance given on a particular risk or not. And once you've got your, your committee, once you've got your terms of reference, uh, and then you've got your calendar of meetings, it's very important to put meetings because if you don't uh, pre-agree on meetings, you might actually find yourself uh, not actually uh, uh, sitting and discussing all this. And the, here I've just uh, indicated the process in short to say this is the pro process up to the point where you'll start to be able to report on a quarterly basis. And I have said your internal audit can sit as the main coordinator uh, uh, or the chairperson uh, for the time uh, being until such time. I think I would prefer that you have a risk, a chief risk officer actually chairing this a uh, 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 combined assurance, and I think I can share uh, uh, the why at a later stage. And then this is your overall implementation uh, uh, process, uh, which I think is straightforward. Uh, your framework, your terms of reference, your strategy, your implementation, utilizing your risk register, and then you then report on a quarterly basis. And then uh, finally, I'm just indicating uh, the uh, combined assurance uh, benefits to say at the end of the day, you are sure that all the risks uh, that are there affecting your institutions, will there will be some level of assurance provided on them to, uh, to you will then reduce uh, assurance uh, 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 fatigue and also assurance cost because there are costs attached in terms of every assurance that is provided uh, to the uh, institution. Um, Lastly, I'm just saying the greatness of a man is not how much wealth he acquires, but in his, but in his integrity and his ability to affect those around him positively. Thank you so much. I hope I did justice. If there are any questions, I will be very glad to answer to those uh, questions. Thank you so much, Buitumel uh, and Roxanne. Okay, thank you so much, Maria, um, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, for the presentation. Um, so um, I'm just going to give the take-homes of, of Maria's presentation. 
um, before we then go to the Q, the Q, the question and answers. Um, the take home is that we must just ensure that we look at where combined assurance started from King three, that's when um, it was then identified and then King four and then elaborated further on how to then implement um, combined assurance. And then the importance of the assurance providers, the credibility um, that they, they, they have, and then the conflict of interest, we must ensure that they always declare their interests. And then another thing is the importance of the quality of information that risk management um, must present. And um, second of last combined assurance committee must then be formed to then ensure that we have a combined assurance model running. And then the terms of reference definitely and the strategy that you can then also present to your other assurance providers, they must be in place. Um, I have noted a few questions from the chat box and um, unfortunately due to time, we will not be able to then um, respond to all of them, but I'll just indicate there's one um, that um, um, I saw, I, I, I feel that it's, it's very important that it will also benefit all of us. It indicates that um, what is there a process in the combined assurance model for qualitative and quantitative um, 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 in, the, in, the, in the combined assurance model. I'm not sure if you got it, um, um, Maria. Is there a process whereby you evaluate qualitative and quantitative analysis in the combined assurance model? And then the second one is that, can you have a manager in the performance management system also being a manager um, in risk management? Can you combine that position? And um, the third question is that regarding slide five, the role of the governing body in the combined assurance. Um, those are the three questions um, that, that I've noted. And then Maria, if you can um, respond to the questions, please. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Buitumelo. And uh, my apologies, really. I think I took, I did not really uh, uh, get notice of time. I'm struggling to get myself up there. Uh, there's something on on my video, but I hope you can hear me. Are you able to hear me, Witumeno? Yes, you are audible, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much. I think in terms of uh, the the first question, I was just trying to put uh, together the other questions. You'll just assist me as we as we continue. If uh, maybe I've missed any question, the first question, yes, there is a process where you you you'll do your quantitative and qualitative, but obviously. Uh, when you are still um when that that role most of the time it will be done by your risk uh, committee currently with the assistance of your 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 risk unit uh, uh, as you are uh, in your first stage you are putting together your combined assurance committee uh, and, and then and as you mature uh, uh, in your combined assurance committee, then you will be able to identify to to see how you can actually go about uh, doing that. Uh, I, I think the critical thing for uh, uh, as you establish for those that are establishing is to just make sure that you put together uh, or the 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 major processes to get yourself running uh, 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 as as a combined assurance committee, which is. Yeah, your establishment of the committee, your terms of reference and getting all assurance providers in the house and also uh, assessing your credibility, which obviously your internal audit can do that assessment of your, your credibility in terms of maybe a, a template of some sort where you are able to have that uh, uh, in place. I think at, at a later stage, at a matured level, then you can be able to, to do your quantitative and your quantitative in terms of your the risk that has been identified within your institution. The, the question on PMS and, uh, and risk management, can they be put together? Really, I think the, the answer there will be, if you can have, I mean, I think that is the responsibility, the role uh, of, of, of management. And I think how you appoint people at a particular level is whether they do have uh, your, your your the the qualification uh, that, that that is uh, can you have a person who has got the qualification of your your risk uh, risk risk management qualification and experience can you have a pe that person can also they be having your performance management and can and uh, 
can you that person that you're going to appoint can that person uh, be uh, able to execute the responsibilities you'd see that uh, the responsibility of pms is a lot uh, and, and also the responsibility of your your risk management also is a lot i've seen other institutions where they establish a senior manager or a director position executive director position where you will have a PMS person, you'll have a risk manager reporting to those people. So I think it just goes with the model of each organization or each institution, but it must be uh, more driven by your qualifications because, I mean, they're all seated at the level, at the second level, and uh, the, the responsibilities, I mean, uh, 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 are clear in terms of uh, uh, what that's expected to be to be doing, and my, maybe you might also also want to also resolve resolve certain issues, issues like who's then going to review the risk management uh, register for for performance management, you know, uh, things like that. So I think it goes with uh, I would not say there is an an uh, yes or no. Uh, answer from my side, but I would say you would look into the dynamics of your institution, how big your institution is, the qualification of that individual, and whether they will be able to carry those responsibilities and the issues of conflict of interest. Uh, the last okay. one, okay. I've forgotten the question. Sorry, but, so, sorry, so, okay. sorry, ma sorry, Maria, to cut you. Unfortunately, due to time, um, we won't be able to take your answer, but then can I ask you that you go into the um, Q&A box and um, answer um, the, the, the remaining question, and you can also look at the other ones and assist. Thank you so much, sure. Maria, for, for your um, wonderful presentation. And with that said, I'd like to um, then introduce Stanley, um, the next speaker. Um, Stanley is an executive president and founder of an investment assurance and management consulting company with interest in private and public sector in South Africa. Mr. Stanley A. Ngobeni, a South African born corporate social investor, donor, fundraising activist, academic, researcher, entrepreneur, director, and philanthropist philanthropist managing and overseeing a combined budget of 40 billion. I have held, okay, this is Mr. Stanley indicating that he has held a number of high profile jobs in the public sector and the private sector, besides developing imp important models and frameworks in the private sector. He's a very, he's very active in audit and risk and also an audit committee chairperson and also risk management chairperson and a project consulting and management. Clearly, uh, Mr. Stanley um, has done a whole, um, he's got a, a really beautiful profile. So Mr. Stanley, the stage is yours. Well, thank you so very much, Mutumeno. Let me uh, take the opportunity to appreciate uh, being invited uh, to this forum uh, to share a view or two. Uh, it is a learning process for myself, and I guess it will be a learning experience for everyone who is in this room. Good morning. Uh, I hope you're well. I think my, my presentation is quite a short one. Uh, I just reinforce some aspects that Maria has spoken to and add a dynamic or two. I'm going to respond comprehensively uh, in the space of five minutes, uh, combined assurance versus the role of ERM. Uh, I must say, uh, would you if you allow me, let me take three seconds and respond to the three questions. One, uh, the issue of the role of the governing body. Uh, the governing body, which is the board, uh, is at the center of uh, combined assurance. Uh, through the ARC or the Audit and Risk Committee. They approve the framework and they get reports quarterly. And at the end of the, uh, the year, they report accordingly. Uh, the issue of mixing the positions, it's going to be a big, big problem, uh, given the fact that the chief risk officer or the risk officer uh, should be independent. And your PMS official, it's a support to management at the core question that was raised. And the other issue of qualitative and quantitative, uh, one can take a, a deliberate, um, detailed response to the metal to me, and then we can deal with that outside of this meeting, uh, outside of the seminar. Uh, the, the, my presentation is quite simple and easy to follow. Uh, I will then try and navigate through combined assurance model. What is that? Uh, avoiding the, the spirit of repetition. I won't repeat what I was talking to. I'll talk briefly on the assurance providers, linking it to the ERM as we know it, 
and the committee, which is uh, run by ERM, which is the risk management committee. And lastly, you will then deal with the role of uh, ERM in implementation of common insurance. That question is answered with Dumelo. Let me just share some, just one issue that I want to share here. I want to look at the definition. We all know what combined assurance is all about. That's the reason why we invest in webinar. Uh, what's scary uh, as of last year, uh, which is 2020, uh, 15 to 30% of entities in South Africa uh, have implemented combined assurance, which is a problem on its own. We have got a long way to go. And then it takes me to the benefits of combined insurance. I've highlighted uh, with Dumelo and the colleagues the key ways in terms of what can we make out of the benefits of combined insurance, and then we link it back to where ERM is. The first issue is around uh, the key risk exposures. Uh, to, co to have a coordinated and relevant assurance efforts uh, on that aspect. The second issue is around business uh, disruptions. Uh, the issue around business interpretation in the disruption, just, just hold on one. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, the issue around business, uh, business uh, reputation, uh, business disruption is around business continuity plans, which is at the core of the mitigation uh, insofar as uh, business continuity is concerned. So one of the business, one of the mitigation strategies is BCP as we know it. The third element is around the improved reporting uh, to committees and the board. And it deals with that question that I was responding to. It then assists in how we effectively report back uh, to, uh, to the board and to the shareholders as it were. The issue of assurance costs, I won't deliberate more on that. We, we definitely uh, at the core of, of uh, implementing combined assurance we we'll save on costs and then we we'll deal with what? Financial risk and the going concern issues. We all know that uh, the entities, companies are battling uh, to settle their, their fees and their, and their accounts. So that will also assist in uh, as a mitigation measure for financial risk as it, as it were. The other areas, it's, it's all about, uh, you know, the last areas that I wanna talk to, it's around integrated reporting. Um, combined assurance is also at the center of integrated reporting as we battle uh, as a country to implement integrated uh, reporting. Uh, we, we definitely uh, need to look closely in the role of um, risk uh, ERM in combined assurance. Last but not least on the benefits, uh, colleagues, it's all about uh, improvement in opportunities identification. We all know we've been talking risk identification is not about time that all in, in Sandy uh, starts to identify uh, opportunities that are linked to the risks that have been identified. So in the main, uh, combined assurance is at the center of that, and it's linked to what us as risk practitioners uh, are assisting on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, the issue of um, it's inherent, it's part of a, a risk mitigation strategy. So you can see out of this what you will then answer is that combined assurance and the role of ERM, you cannot divorce the two together. If you were to put an equation, you would definitely uh, find that in that, in that mathematical equation, uh, as it were. So that's the first part in so far as the relationship between the two. We cannot uh, talk combined assurance if we don't talk ERM from where I am sitting. And I'm advocating that uh, to add all in this room. It, 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 then, then the next slide, if I will be able to, to move this slide, this was just dealing with the, the role of the audit committee. We all know the subcommittee of the board or the subcommittee of council is the audit committee. Amongst the mandate or the fiduciary responsibility of um, the audit committee is risk management and also combined assurance. So the two uh, has to feature in what we do uh, because we are ultimate supporter. Audit, audit committee. It might be via the risk management uh, committee uh, to the audit committee and the board. So that you will see that we feature very, very heavily and our uh, contribution cannot be underplayed uh, as it were. Then uh, I think Maria has spoken a lot around uh, what qualifies one to be an assurance provider. 
And that's the reason with female, I, I, I had to respond to the whole issue of a, a chief risk officer a moonlighting as a PMS a manager. That won't assist and that won't help because immediately there are a few uh, criteria that you won't check of, of who do we call an assurance uh, provider. Independence, objectivity, the issue of interest, uh, not in a bad way, interest uh, as we know it, and skills and, uh, and experience. Uh, that will also play an issue there. And last, which is very important, one to be an assurance provider in a combined assurance model must have a what? An assurance methodology. We all know uh, ERM has a methodology. Will the PMS uh, manager have a methodology? The answer will definitely be a no. So that uh, must be a takeaway for me. One need to qualify uh, uh, justify, justifiably so as an insurance provider. Then I will navigate. Um, the slides will be shared. Um, Ruki Melo and the team and Roxana will share the slide. These are uh, some of the assurance providers. We all know them from internal all the way to the external site, and, and it then incorporate both public sector and private sector. That's what one has done here. What has been good of late, which comes out of COVID, which remember uh, we have seen the OHS committees uh, as they will manage COVID going forward. So those it becomes also key uh, in, in what we do, and we all know the COVID-related risk that you identify and part of my insurance as we know it. If I were to move the legislative mandate, we've spoken to that, and I won't repeat, and you've reflected on it quite correctly uh, with the men. These are some of the guidelines uh, that we can take home to, 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 in, to assist us as we unpack this whole issue of combined national in our role as the uh, in this big scheme of things. I can then move to uh, the combined assurance uh, model, uh, the levels uh, or the levels of defense. And Maria has spoken to that, but what's key for me, a uh, first level executive committee which is made up of management and you would risk management committee and you would ARC uh, at the bottom, uh, which then feeds into uh, the, the board uh, or the accounting authority and all the way to the shareholders uh, as we know them. Then uh, these are some of the activities one can undertake uh, to get uh, combined assurance going. Uh, these are nice steps to have, but if you look at step three, it talks about the risk analysis. Very, very important. Very, very important, and it's where we are playing. That's our space. So you can see out of the steps that one can articulate in implementing combined assurance with future uh, as part of our risk um, fiduciary responsibility as PIM, whether it's in the form of us facilitating the sessions or um, monitoring and reporting uh, going forward. We all know that um, combined assurance must end up with the audit committee. That's what you see in the steps from 7 to 12, and which will end up uh, at the board level being discussed. Uh, at that, at that level. Then the, the, the other issues, what, what one proposes um, in terms of addressing the 70 uh, shortfall of uh, implementation of combined assurance is very important for one uh, to look at the first in approach. Uh, the, the whole issue of trying to implement combined assurance in totality uh, might create some change management issues. We faced an approach where we can show uh, the, uh, the benefits and the successes of what we're trying to get to, and we are able to customize uh, to all the entities and the companies that we are dealing with. Uh, in the main, uh, these are the implementation steps. Uh, I, I then decide to depict it uh, from the from those steps, you will see on the left hand side what you'll see there the ERM maturity non negotiable. If risk management maturity is at its lowest, combined assurance becomes a big problem. Uh, our awareness, uh, risk management awareness, and combined assurance awareness must work hand in hand. And we need to be able to, uh, to, provide, to provide and produce governance documents uh, that goes all the way. And what's key out of the government's uh, governance document with email is an alignment of the charters, whether it's your, your risk management committee charter, the audit committee charter, and the board charter. Very important uh, because we need to work in sync and we know what to expect, when and how. Uh, in conclusion of my presentation, the role of ERM, just to reinforce some aspects of my presentation, one, 
it, it becomes the cornerstone, uh, risk management becomes the cornerstone of combined insurance. And we all know the combined insurance plan for me should be based on risk uh, and uh, a sound risk management in each and every organization becomes very important because that's the foundation of combined insurance, the combined insurance plan. We all know risk uh, informs internal audit plan. With its own limitation, we augment now and then with the knowledge of the business as internal auditors or external auditors. However, we all know the foundation of the internal audit plan is risk which we normally call it risk age. The success of combined assurance is linked for me to the ERM maturity of any organization that we find, even the country at large as well. The CRO must be part of the combined assurance forum, uh, what they are referred to as a committee, and that forum needs to be formulated and um, the CRO must support uh, the, the, the CAE in this regard. And there was a question that talks to uh, who is better placed to coordinate this. It's better placed to be coordinated by an internal auditor uh, who reports a uh, functional audit committee supported by the CEO as it were. Well. Uh, you know, things that I've seen, I won't share with you what I've seen in entities where you find uh, the champion of uh, combined assurance is actually the wrong role. Yes. Combined assurance must be a standing item in all the risk management committee meetings and the chairperson of the risk management committee must report to the audit committee on the aspect of combined assurance. And as I said, combined assurance must be a part, a section in the risk management committee and all the way. Here is uh, where I end with you, man. Thank you so very much. I hope I was able to do justice to the time allocated. And then back it here, allow some discussion or questions and we can then address this important topic. Thank you, Stanley, for your presentation. Thank you, Stanley, for your presentation. As I've indicated um, before that, um, I will then be giving you the take home. What is it that you should take um, from um, Mr. Ngobeni's um, presentation? Um, firstly, um, he actually highlighted the benefits of having a combined assurance model and the importance of coordinated efforts. That is um, the collaboration that I've indicated earlier on, that they, the, it is very much important that we collaborate and stop the silos um, working mentality and the effect that it also minimizes um, business interruptions. The other take home is that who is an assurance um, provider? Um, that, that is one um, highlight that it also be, it has been highlighted by both speakers, like who are the role players? Um, the levels of defense, we have five, we have four. Um, uh, in, in this instance, you know, I, I believe that we can just expand, as 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 Mem Maria has, has said in her in her presentation, that it also goes along with your organization, the model that you you would have in your organization, and then the implementation steps is very much important that you then have um, the implementation steps of your combined assurance model, and um, another thing that um, Mr. Sandy indicated is the, the 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 alignment of your charters of those charter with governance. You cannot have a board charter saying that, and whereas the your audit committee charter saying something else, but then they should um, talk. You know they should then be aligned. Um, I I just um, on the Q and A's. Um, this is what I got. Um, but Mr. Stanley just answered one um, regarding who should chair the 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 the, the combined insurance committee. Definitely the CAE. And then what are the three combined assurance takeouts um, you are leaving risk management um, practitioners with? It is one of the questions. Um, Mr. Stanley, and then the second one is that at what level um, can we then have um, put, at what level can we have um, oversight stru structures? Um, it, it is, I think the question is more related at what level of defense, because you're having those five lines of defense and then oversight structures, they made an example like Coxta, at what level can you then um, place Coxta there? So I'll um, hand it over to you, Mr. Stanley, to then um, respond to the questions. Yeah, um, thank you so very much, Mutumela, for, for the questions. I think the first one on the CAE and the, uh, him leading, I've responded to that. For me, the three take out uh, takeaways would then be one, uh, as ERM officials, 
let's not be left behind. Um, this is a, a tool that we can use as a, a, a mitigation measure for each and every organization. Uh, the issue of making sure that we, um, we are the right assurance provider and uh, we are not uh, apologetic about that. And last but not least, uh, we need to take uh, our role is a legislative role seriously. Whether you look at King 4, King 3, and the Companies Act, and also uh, the MFMA and PFMA. In terms of COXTA, I think for me, uh, you can safely uh, put them a, a, at level three, the fact that they are wholly independent. However, uh, there are limitations to what they can do, uh, given uh, I, I am I'm privy to all the COXTAs in the country. Uh, they are limited in number, uh, they are limited in number. So capacity is an issue there. So that's where I will leave it with Mela. I hope I've not missed any other question, uh, but I will then say, uh, let me, let me thank you so very much. Okay, thanks, um, Stanley. The last question is that who's supposed to serve in the combined assurance committee? I see that we still have um, some few minutes left. Please respond to that. All right, who should serve in the Combined Assurance uh, Committee of Framework 1, the CAE as a convener, the coordinator. Uh, you then look at all your assurance uh, providers internally. Let me start with internally. You've got the chief risk officer. Uh, you'll have your legal manager. Um, you, you can as well, if, 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 if uh, the, the entity or uh, the organization is best enough, uh, you have your... your the colleague, whoever is coordinating around strategy, uh, whether it's monitoring and evaluation, you can bring that uh, on board. And you can then stretch it externally. You bring in the AG, very, very important. I think as public committee, you always hang on them when are they starting to rely on the work we do, whether it's ERM or internal audit. Uh, so you bring them on board, and then you then include all the other stakeholders in the public sector, and the treasury and COXTA and bring them all on board and serve that. And, and that. So, so that's, that's in a nutshell what you can have as part of the commercial, but let's not have a very big team. What a, a forum, what I would then propose uh, when we have that say, what that committee, for me, uh, it will be a very, very a great arrangement if that committee were to sit uh, before a pack is disseminated to any subcommittee of the board uh, and also uh, if it's cancelled before disseminated uh, to any subcommittee or council. Uh, so we know that the committee or the forum has looked at uh, the submission and quality has been uh, How often uh, we do go into a board meeting or a subcommittee meeting, you can report uh, management, which normally, uh, uh, whatever I said, you know, I feel it's counterproductive. That's where we should be discussing issues rather than retaining uh, so this forum can be a very, very um, a preparatory uh, uh, arrangement for any oversight in the organization. Okay, thank you so much, um, Stanley, for responding to the questions. I believe that Everyone is satisfied um, with the answers that they got, but please, um, Mr. Stanley, continue looking at the chat box and then I'm um, responding to any um, questions that um, might um, arise from there. And um, now moving on to our last um, speaker of the day. Um, we're saving the best for last because women are always the best. Um, Ms. Giovanna Derisi. Ms. Giovanna Derisi is a qualified chartered accountant and a certified internal auditor. She has been delivering integrated governance, risk and internal audit services to the clients in private and public sector for over 20 years. She assists clients to develop and enhance governance and combined assurance frameworks and models and practices both locally as well as internationally. Um, what, I, what I didn't indicate is that uh, Ms. Giovanna is an executive at PwC. So, um, Ms. Giovanna, the stage is yours. Please, um, you can start with your presentation. Watamela, thank you so much for that. Um, can you just give me a heads up that you can see my presentation? Yes, 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 I can see. Perfect. It. Thank you so thank much. You. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, this morning, I'm going to just share a few practical pointers from PwC's point of view in terms of how we go about assisting our clients with the implementation of, of combined assurance, as well as then focus on, on the role of ERM within the, the combined assurance model. Um, so if we start um, looking at, at why there's a need for, for co uh, combined assurance, um, at PwC, we've analyzed the, the corporate failures that we've seen over the last couple of years, both locally here in South Africa, as well as globally. And there's a few apparent failures that have occurred, um, which have seen the significant value destruction of these organizations. And the first one I want to touch on is the understanding of the nature and quantum of risk. So there definitely you can see the, the link to the role of ERM. As boards in a number of companies, there's no real understanding of the nature and the quantum of risk that they are accepting or opportunities that they're pursuing. Um, and that has resulted in, in value destruction. And there's obviously the first key role of, of risk officers to help the boards understand that nature and quantum of risk. The second item that has seen significant value destruction in organization is obviously the appropriate involvement in risk assurance oversight at a board level. Um, so the board's understanding, obviously, first, the nature and quantum of risk, and then secondly, making sure that from an organizational point of view, they're obtaining the right assurance over those risks. The, the third item is the strategy and operating models that have not always been able to respond quickly enough to declining market conditions and challenges. Uh, also, value destruction is destroyed through understandings by boards and organizations of the um, relationship with key stakeholders and making sure that the stakeholder needs are then appropriately addressed through the um, organizational strategy and risk um, strategies. Obviously, we've also seen um, there's been uh, regulatory compliance has been increasing. Um, and obviously, if the company strategies are not aligned to address those regulatory compliance, we see value destruction. And there as well, there's a role for it, risk practitioners to, to bring those risks to the fore of the board and executive. And then lastly, obviously, the, the risk assurance strategies we've seen implemented in various organizations don't necessarily apply the appropriate level of assurance, um, obviously, to um, give assurance over the risks um, that they're appropriately being mitigated and that the controls have been appropriately designed and are working effectively. And most importantly, those risk strategies don't give personal protection to the executive and board members. And this has, is um, some of the reasons that we've identified over significant value destruction. And this is important because obviously implementing an effective combined assurance model would address a number of, of these failures. Uh, my colleagues have already spoken about what is combined assurance. What I would like to share with you is obviously the, the second and third bullet is our practical way of looking at, at what combined assurance is. So it's about assurance providers working more closely together. And a little bit later in my slideshow, I will show you from our um, 2020 risk in review um, research study, um, the difference between where currently assurance providers are maybe communicating together, but they are not really at that level of collaboration um, to make the combined assurance model implementation really effective. The second one is about ensuring that obviously you give assurance in, in the right areas. Um, and there it is critical from a risk, a risk management practitioner to ensure that you assist the organization in identifying those risks. And interestingly enough, in our 2020 PwC risk in review study, we noted that currently um, from 120 executives and board members interviewed that only 50% of them actually believe they currently have the right data today to anticipate and manage existing and emerging risks. And this then significantly dropped to 33% that say they have the right technology and tools that assist them in order to identify the, the right risks. So here alone, um, there's a big reason for risk practitioners to step up and make sure that they assist the organization in identifying those, those risk areas. 
obviously my colleagues have talked about making sure that the assurance is received from the best people with the most relevant skills and a bit later in the presentation i will obviously talk about the role of erm um, as a second line assurance provider and then obviously in the model you want to ensure that you deliver the assurance in the most cost effective way possible and very important, um, the last statement at the bottom, making sure you have the right amount of assurance. And that is dependent on the risk appetite of, of the organization or the company and the guidance on how much needs to be provided through the board and its subcommittees, um, especially the, the audit and risk committee, which is then the, the governing body tasked with implementing the, the combined assurance model. And there also, when we look at the risk appetite of the organization, that is where yourselves as risk practitioners work. And this is why it's important um, that you then obviously give assurance over the risk management processes that you implement within your organization. On the next slide, um, just want to highlight um, the different components to combined assurance, as well as what is the dependency in terms of having an effective um, control, a combined assurance model. So the first one is obviously dependent on the maturity of the different lines of assurance. Um, and obviously we have seen in practice that not all assurance providers are necessarily at the same maturity levels. Some assurance providers have more structured approaches and methodologies such as internal audit um, and others are you're going to have to take them along on the journey of, of combined assurance. Um, the second one is obviously my colleagues have alluded to the maturity and the effectiveness of the risk management system. Risks is obviously the, the foundation for combined assurance and obviously maturing the, the risk management function will obviously mature the, the risk information so that we then assured that the assurance that's provided within the organization is over those most key critical risks of, of the organization. Also important is the effectiveness of the and well established in governing uh, model um, of the organization that then obviously holds accountable and responsible the different assurance providers within the model. If I then move over to, to the components of combined assurance, uh, my colleagues have alluded to the combined assurance approach or strategy and framework um, that needs to be developed as part of the combined assurance model. And I think key here, it's important as risk um, practitioners to understand that those models and approaches and frameworks and strategies need to integrate and leverage off your current ERM processes, systems and data. And this is where the role of, of yourselves become so critical in making sure that those process systems and data um, are at a level where um, combined assurance can then obviously use that as, as a platform. And in addition to that, it also needs to align with uh, in line with your overall company strategy and risk strategy. And obviously risk uh, management is about mitigating the risks to achieve the objectives. Therefore, combined assurance also needs to consider the, the objectives of the company and making sure we are assuring those significant risks that, that affect um, the, the organizational strategy. Obviously very important is the, the definition of the different roles and responsibilities that assurance providers have within this model. And that's why it's key that those roles and responsibilities be defined in the framework um, so that all the assurance providers understand um, which line they belong to and what is the level of assurance that they then provide um, to the organization in terms of the risks to which they are best suited to, to give assurance to. Then the last couple of items is then to deal with the operalization of the, the combined assurance model and obviously developing your combined assurance or a, a platform of risk um, that's robust and then obviously um, ensuring that you do then implement a reporting dashboard to provide back the, the views of the different assurance providers um, in terms of their assessment of the controls and risk mitigation strategies. And very important as, as part of this process, and this is where currently I think a lot of people are, are talking to each other in terms of sharing of information, but not necessarily as assurance providers challenging each other in terms of the view that they have over the, 
the risk mitigations and, and the controls within an organization. And later you will see in, in a slide where I talk about to really be effective, combined assurance needs to have a collaborative point of view where the forums that my colleagues have mentioned are used strategically to, to challenge each other as risk practitioners and assurance providers um, in terms of the views that we form over the, the control environment at our organizations. Um, so at PwC, we talk about an integra integrated risk assurance strategy that we apply in, the, in assisting our clients with combined assurance model. And why is this slight, is slightly different from um, the, the normal implementation is that we obviously make sure we look at company value drivers, making sure that the assurance plan is mapped to give assurance over the, the company value drivers and the risks that obviously will impact those value drivers. And a little bit later, I will give you a practical example in terms of why, what we've seen around company value drivers in the assurance model space and how that can be enhanced by yourself as, as risk practitioners. Our solution also ensures that boards and executive fiduciary duties and responsibilities are catered for in the assurance that's provided in the model um, so that it gives actually personal protection to the boards and executives um, so that when issues arise and they will arise as much as you have a robust combined assurance model in place, things happen in businesses. Uh, but obviously being able then to demonstrate from a board and executive perspective um, what those processes were um, and obviously um, then obviously giving protection to, to the boards and executives. We also only don't look at the negative aspects of risk when we consider combined assurance, but it's both from a risk and opportunity universe. Um, and that's obviously where, where yourself as risk practitioners come in uh, to make sure that the organization do identify um, the, the most relevant risks and opportunities that, that impact their strategy. We also link within our combined assurance model, um, the COSO framework. Um, in terms of um, how controls are designed, uh, making sure that that is challenged in the development of, of the combined assurance plan so that assurance providers then really focus on the key risks um, that will then uh, mitigate the, the risk of, of realizing the, the negative downside. We also talk about a, a coordinated um, combined assurance approach. And that is where obviously through the combined assurance plan, we've allocated roles and responsibilities to the most um, specialized assurance providers to make sure that they focus on the respective aspects of that risk and control, and obviously then come together to provide a collective view to the board and audit committee um, on the mitigation and the controls. And then obviously very important is um, the, the lines of defense, harnessing the knowledge and experience of all the assurance providers, as well as the board um, and the board subcommittees. And that then brings me to, to the next slide, which I mentioned our view in terms of ensuring that a combined assurance model is implemented across the, the key value drivers of an organization. So we've obviously, um, as a firm, identified 13 key value drivers that, that would drive any business, um, can be applied um, in a similar manner between both the public and the private sector, um, obviously with, with a few tweaks to, to the strategies themselves. And we've allocated that responsibility to, to the board and its various board subcommittees. I think my colleagues this morning mentioned obviously the role of the audit committee and obviously they have four value drivers which they focus on, um, which is operational productivity, um, compliance, etc. And I think the assurance has been a has been in place for a long time so it's very formalized um, and and it's normally very robust. However, if I take an example of, of where we've seen things go wrong at organization is an organization decides to, to take, take on a new merger acquisition as part of their growth strategy. And you'll see there it's the responsibility of the board and the investment committee. What we've seen practically is that as assurance providers and risk practitioners, we are not necessarily at those board meetings, understanding what is happening within the organization and making sure that those risks are identified um, and therefore then 
um, internal audit together with the rest of the combined assurance forum can then put appropriate assurance strategies in place to give comfort to the board um, that in terms of this new merger and acquisition that they're trying to source, um, that they have then considered things of do we need a due diligence, what are some of the risks, um, specific risks are related to that merger and acquisition that need to be assured. Um, therefore, as, as risk practitioners, I think my, my suggestion to you today is do you have a seat on, on each of these committees, subcommittees of the board? And do you, within that committee, challenge um, the board members and executive in terms of the risks that are identified in those other value drivers um, to make sure that they are then identified and assurance strategies can be developed over those. And obviously, ultimately accountable and responsible for the model is the audit committee. So we also realize that there needs to be more extensive communication between the audit committee and the other subcommittees of the board to really understand what are the assurance needs at the other committee levels, that those are incorporated in the combined assurance plan, which is then monitored and managed from an audit committee perspective, but then that it also feeds back to the other committees in respect of the individual roles and responsibilities um, as a board committee. As part of our PwC 2021 Digital Trust Insight Survey, we asked organizations whether they have operational resilience it needs to thaw the impact of threats into the future. And I think you'll be quite surprised there to see that 49% oh, that of organizations say they do not have risk internal audit compliance and cybersecurity teams that are working together to develop a common view of risks, threats across the, the ecosystem. And I think this alone shows us how much work we as risk practitioners, as, and as well as risk functions and assurance providers, um, the work that we need to do within our organization to make sure we, we really have a common view of risks and threats across the organization so that those can then be appropriately assured. Then coming to, to the role of, of risk functions, um, in our PwC 2020 Global Risk Study, we found that just 27% of risk functions have a real integrated tone for, for risk management. And I think this shows us the, the role today of the ERM, that obviously we need to, to assist the organizations to, to have a more integrated tone for risk management. And what does that mean? It means we need to be active participants to help and achieve and protect the value of our organizations. Um, we need to have a closer um, risk function collaboration so that within the organizations, we are able to identify those blind spots. Um, and obviously, very important in ensuring our constant coordination is the use of a common risk language, um, a common data source, a consolidated view of risk, and a shared technology platform. And maybe if I ask you today to introspect how many with, of you within your organizations do have a common risk language where no matter where in the business you speak to an executive, they have a common understanding of the risks that the organization face? Do you have a common data source platform um, where you're able to provide the consolidated view of risk? And can you share that platform, not only amongst yourselves as risk professionals, but also amongst the other assurance providers within the organization so that they can feed back and provide input into those risks? And obviously by doing that, we obviously wanna provide a more comprehensive and more predictive risk insights um, to support our organizations firstly to, to protect the value, um, keep the, the different projects that you may have on track and obviously enable that we are able to achieve our, our strategies. I think there was a question in, in the Q&A session in terms of what is the actual role and assurance provided by yourselves as ERM practitioners? And I think that the role of ERM in itself is an assurance activity. So I think there is always a misconception to say, I'm, I'm doing my ERM job, 
but now I have combined assurance and, and what is the additional activities I, I need to undertake. Yes, there is a little bit of additional work that needs to be done um, as risk practitioners. However, the work that is currently performed um, as an ERM practitioner is assurance activity in terms of the second line. So if we run through some of those assurance activities, it's obviously about facilitating the governance of risk and controls um, through self-assessments in which you identify and measure risk, as well as challenge the business on the controls that they put forward in order to, to mitigate those risks. The, the second item is about yourselves monitoring those key risks and control indicators giving management an assessment quarterly on whether the, the risk mitigation strategies are being implemented and are they being effective or does management need to, to identify alternative um, risk mitigation strategies. Also in terms of your, your role is to monitor the losses and investigate remedial action for root causes um, where these arise. Also performing targeted deep dives where you have specific assessment of risk and controls in specifically high risk areas or new projects such as the, the mergers and acquisition example that, that I used earlier. You also have a role in, in terms of tracking remediation and risk acceptance of issues. So where as a risk practitioner, you do believe that the organizations and accepting a level of risk um, that is undue, you obviously need to discuss that with, with the committee or audit committee and the board to make sure management really understands um, the level of risk that they are accepting. Um, as risk practitioners, you guys can also run scenario planning and stress testing um, in order to give the, the organization comfort in terms of, of the impact of the risk, um, as well as doing diagnostic reviews, as well as flash reviews, um, where you obviously focus on one or two key objectives and the effectiveness of, of the controls for the organization. I spoke about um, our 2020 risk in review where we identified the different phases of communication, coordination and collaboration among risk functions um, today and the impact that it has on, on the implementation of an effective internal audit, uh, effective combined assurance model. Um, and obviously my colleagues said a very low percentage of organizations in South Africa, 15 to 30% have currently got um, combined assurance models in place. And, and the reason for that is a lot of the, the collaboration is done at such a low level um, that the real benefits of combined assurance um, are not realized. So in our risk in review, we identified four stages, which is the haddock stage where risk functions work pre predominantly together when a risk event occurs, um, then moving up the continuum to communicating. So you communicate with, with the rest of the assurance providers in the fraternity within the organization on a regular basis. Um, then you take it a step uh, up where the risk functions use a common risk language and obviously routinely coordinate their activities. And I think that's where a lot of, of our organizations are today. Um, some may not necessarily have a, a common risk language, but they do try and coordinate the, their activities. Um, however, to really have an effective combined assurance model, you need to get to a stage where, where you're collaborating as risk functions. And that means as an organization, you have a common data technology source um, where you identify the risks. Um, it helps to eliminate your risk blind spots and obviously enables you to provide strategic assurance over the, the most um, important risks of the organization in a comprehensive and, and timely manner. On the next slide, I just want to share with you the industry view from our study in terms of where risk functions are, are really collaborating. And I think at the top end, um, not surprisingly, you can see that that financial services is there. I think they, they're very regulated. And in terms of that regulation, um, the collaboration is, is mandatory. So, so you do see that it's in place, but you can then see for the other industries, um, obviously some of them at coordinating um, and somewhere between communicating and coordinating. Um, and I know the public sector in, in our in our when we run our surveys um, slots in with the retail consumer and products um, industries. So there currently we can see that we are currently at a very low level 
um, and we obviously need to put measures in place as risk professionals um, to get us up that value chain of, of collaborating and obviously um, enhancing the combined assurance model within our organizations. So what um, do companies have to get right as they embark on, on this combined assurance journey? So we've seen a lot of, of pitfalls that company have fallen into. And from that, we've obviously determined some of the key critical success factors that, that organizations need to consider. So firstly, collectively, everyone needs to believe in the true aim of, of combined assurance. It's not about coordinating a few tasks, um, because if you do that, you, you're wasting your time and energy. It's about looking at the, the broader view in terms of our combined assurance strategy, um, designing that, and then making sure that the whole organization is working towards that. And very important, it's just driven from the top. Um, so you need to have your end in mind and then shape your process and your roadmap um, to get there with the right strategic executive support and sponsorship. It's also about deciding on where you start with the scope. Um, obviously, you cannot boil the, the sea in one go, and that's the same with, with combined assurance. Start small, start practically, um, obviously build the principles and the behavior, and then you can expand the, the project. Also making sure that you have accountability and ownership from the start. Um, we have a saying, if it's not measured, it's not done. So making sure that within the organization, um, everyone understands their roles and responsibilities and that that is defined in, in their performance contract so it can be measured um, right from the start. And then very important, also agree on the reporting outcomes that you do wanna achieve and set those then as a goal as part of your, your roadmap. Then in terms of some of the critical success factors, which I think yourselves as ERM practitioners have a big role to play, is obviously making sure that you're able to provide the organization with a common risk language that is used equally by management as well as assurance providers, um, as well as that there's an alignment to, to methodologies. Um, obviously, there will be some tweaking in terms of specific assurance provider methodologies, but making sure that the ERM framework um, that forms the basis of, of the combined assurance model. My colleagues have spoken about um, the definitions of, of assurance providers, so I'm not going to go through that. Um, but also very important then as a success factor is to de clearly define the roles, given the huge amount of interworking and interdependencies um, within the risks and the control environment, um, making sure that you identify all your assurance providers and get commitment to cooperate, mm -hmm. uh, making sure you have an executive sponsor, you have the, the steering committee. Make sure that you have a communication in place, uh, plan in place, um, predominantly driven through, through your steering committees and the meetings that happen. And obviously, the, the less mature you are, the more meetings you're going to have, but making sure that you do communicate um, the requirements of the model throughout the, the organization. Uh, sorry, Giovanni. Yes. Um, yeah, we are almost out of time. Can you please maybe just try to wrap up I'm so that it can take Thank you. 100%. So the last slide uh, was just to talk about the benefits. Um, so I'm only going to highlight the ones that are, are relevant to yourself. So obviously working from a common risk landscape, um, making sure that there's focus, coordination, um, and then obviously deploying the, the right resources. And maybe what I want to leave you with is just a thought from our publication um, is obviously we need to think together, move together collaborate for deeper risk insights to protect, enable, and enhance your organization's value for tomorrow. Um, thank you so much for your time this morning, um, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, um, Giovanni, for a nice presentation. And I'm just going to then highlight quickly the take-homes from what we got from your presentation. Um, you indicated um, value destruction. Value destruction that will definitely um, be um, more relevant in the private sector, but in um, 
public sector, it will be more about um, the impact that it will have on service delivery and also the reputational damage that it will do. And then combined assurance model frameworks, the integration to both our strategies. We're having our strategies, our APP should be aligned to that and also our ERM framework. And then you highlighted the solutions that are available in the market. And yeah, I highlighted the one, one of the solutions that um, PwC has um, developed. And the key value drivers um, versus the responsible committee. Um, I got um, to, to check one of the questions was that, why must we have um, um, so many committees? But I believe that your slide on um, key value drivers versus the responsible committee will then um, assist in answering that question as to then it, it indicates what will that um, committee be responsible of and um, how to get it right definitely the tone at the top um, reporting and accountability so that's 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 um, the take-homes that I have from your presentations and then with the Q's and A's the first one is that can the, um, oh no, let me just skip that one because I indicated earlier on it's, it's regarding the, the lot, lot of committees that we have. Then the role of governing body in the three lines of assurance um, that you indicated in slide five. They then um, want um, to then um, that you indicate what is the role of the governing body and um, technology that can be used to enhance um, combined assurance. What technology is there? And how does the model on slide seven support the integration objective in slide nine? Yeah, those are the questions. 100%. So maybe firstly, just um, in terms of the committees, I do want to make a, a comment around that. It's basically to say it's only the, the combined assurance steering committee, which is the formal committee where assurance providers will meet and, and debate um, the, the various items. Then um, in, in terms of, of the other questions, um, the role of, of the governing body. So the in our model, obviously we, we I told you we keep the, the model simplistic. Um, so we talk about the three lines of defense, but we do have a number of clients where that model has four lines, five lines. So in a, in a five line model, um, the, the governing body would be the, the oversight body um, that is then responsible obviously to provide oversight over that model. And that predominantly would be the audit and, and risk committee. Um, to give assurance that the model is indeed being implemented um, and that it is effective. However, in terms of the views that I that are provided, that also needs to extend further to the other board um, subcommittees um, roles and responsibilities. Um, I just want to quickly go through to um, it was slide seven and sorry, Boitamela. Okay, sorry, it was slide seven and nine. Seven and nine. Yes. Okay. So okay, maybe, so seven. Maybe just, okay, you're fine with the question. Yes, it was to understand how obviously the slide nine integrates back to um, slide seven. Yes, yes. Hundred percent. So, so what we said in slide nine was that just twenty-seven percent of risk functions really have an integrated tone for for risk management, and that means as as assurance providers, and and that is collectively across the the different lines of defence, be it one, three, four, five, as many as the the organisation opts to have in terms of their strategy and framework. Um, it's making sure that those key drivers, which is obviously going to be ERM, so risk practitioners, and obviously from the third line will be your internal audit function. Do they then have seats at the various board and board subcommittees so that they can challenge the board and the executives at those committees in terms of the risks that are identified in terms of the, the 13 key value drivers that, that we've identified across, uh, across an organization organization. Um, so, so that is the link, is, is to make sure that as ERM practitioners, as, as internal audit, do we have a seat at those tables so that we understand the strategies of the organization in the different committees, um, that we help challenge the executives and the board in terms of have they identified the correct risks, and then challenge them in terms of where the assurance over those key risks needs to take place um, so that we can then put those strategies in place. It doesn't necessarily mean that within an organization, you may at all times have um, 
the competency to to perform that that assurance activity. And I take maybe the example back to, to the mergers and acquisition, uh, where as a risk official, you would probably tell the, the investment committee, we actually need to have a due diligence done because there's a risk um, that this organization may not be, may not meet our requirements. From an audit committee, uh, from an internal audit perspective, the third line will say, uh, Yes, I will definitely run with that, but I do not have M&E experience within my internal audit unit, but I will source that, make sure that the scope covers the risks and um, requirements of the organization, strategically assess the outcomes and report back to, to the investment committee in terms of the results of, of that assurance. Um, so that is then the, the linkage between slide um, seven and nine. Boitemelo, sorry, I've forgotten the last question, the third question. Okay, um, sorry about the noise. Um, I think it's an alarm. Okay, the third question is, it was regarding the technology that can be used to enhance combined assurance. So currently, um, I think we're all very aware the, there's not a lot of technology out of out there um, that obviously has been built for for combined assurance. And I think the the reason for that is we we don't have a lot of combined assurance models implemented um, within our different organisations um, in South Africa and even globally. So the the types of technologies that that you need to consider are, are GRC types tools. Um, also considering your, your risk tool currently and seeing whether that risk tool can be further enhanced to provide for um, assurance activities and reporting um, is obviously then something that as organizations you'll have to consider in terms of, of expanding your, your tool capability. Um, some of the tools obviously that, that we've seen our clients use um, is obviously Teammate Plus, um, which is predominantly an internal audit software, but does have a risk module capability, um, as well as then has a combined assurance model um, module um, attached to that where all assurance providers can collaborate. Um, it is actually an online tool. Um, so, so our customers and um, clients find that, that quite um, useful to, to use. Um, and obviously then some of, of the bigger systems, um, SAP, GRC is, is something else that we've seen um, customers used. Um, a lot of other organizations have then developed um, their, their own online um, SharePoints and, and Excel databases, et cetera, to assist with, with this coordination. But I think it always depends on, on the size of the, the organization in terms of which tool um, is then selected. Thank you, Boitemelo. Thank you so much, um, Giovanni, for your presentation and the Q's and A's. Um, sorry about this. There's um, a bit of construction happening now at our offices. I'm sorry about it. Can I just... Um, ask um, Roxanne to then maybe um, try to do the closing remarks. Thank you. Okay, I'm um, sorry about that, colleagues. Um, Roxanne says I'm audible enough. I can then um, continue with my closing remarks. Thank you so much, um, everyone, um, for the presentations. And um, can I ask our presenters to then continue looking at the chat box and answering the questions? Um, there are some few questions that were not answered. And as a take home um, from what I got is that we must know that as risk practitioners, we are one of the assurance providers. Risk management itself, it is an assurance activity. And with that said, the presentations will then be available. And I thank you so much um, for attending this. And we hope to then host uh, more events um, in the future. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>